Welcome to the lunch discussion. It's a great pleasure for us to welcome our friend and colleague here at Hoover, Adam White, who consented to do double duty today. He's going to be a discussant later on. Stay tuned for that. But he also agreed to give us some thoughts to digest along with our lunch. And so uh, let me turn the floor over to Adam. Welcome. Well, thank you. I hope what I'm about to say is easier to swallow than the sandwiches. I um, you know, this paper, it's obviously very different than the other papers that are presented today because um, it originated from a different project. And so I'm, it's funny when you, you said I, I agreed to present here. I mean, I'm grateful to be, to be invited. Um, this paper reflects just me thinking through the current debate over civil service reform and the relationship between bureaucracy and the political leadership in our federal government. Obviously an issue that's been very much in the news in, in the last year and a half, and I'll get to that. Um, this paper was was written a while ago uh, for a program at the University of Virginia in their government department, a program, a, a, a symposium by Jim Caesar, who's also a Hoover Fellow, um, where we were thinking through uh, the relationship historically between, um, between the government leaders and government officials and their relationship and often the dissent within government and around government. So that's why this paper looks a, uh, a, little, bit, a little bit different. Um, if I put together a slideshow, my one and only slide would have been the two quotes from the top of the paper. Um, often when lawyers or law professors think about the relationship between the president and the, uh, and the civil service, we go back to the Humphreys executor case, um, which wasn't about civil service per se, but was about the president's leadership and control over the bureaucracy. And Chief Justice Taft, who obviously knew more firsthand about the presidency than any other Supreme Court justice, has a great line in his opinion where he says, the president must place in each member of his official family and his chief executive so subordinates implicit faith. And sure, that's true. But when I see that quote, I think to think of Tolstoy and Anna Karenina who said, all happy families are alike. Each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And as you trace the history of the relationship between the president and the bureaucracy, you see different kinds of unhappiness at different times. And with each iteration of the relationship between the leadership and the bureaucracy, you see the, the administration and Congress trying to solve the problem that came before it, right? So that preceded it. So right now, to the extent that the people see a problem, they largely see it, I think, as a problem of the bureaucracy being insufficient, not just insufficiently responsive to political leadership, but, you know, in some ways outright defiant of politically elected or appointed leadership, right? We have... Uh, some in the bureaucracy, I don't want to overstate it because I don't think it's too many people, but there's some in the bureaucracy who stand up and identify themselves as a so-called resistance movement. Well, that's fascinating and interesting, and if it were to take on critical mass, I think it would be a little disturbing. I don't know that we're there yet, but it is, in the meantime, at least interesting, right, that you have people in the bureaucracy who are willing and able to stand up and say we are a resistance movement to the political leadership and that we will use the tools at our disposal to actively thwart the work of the appointed leadership. So that was, again, the origin of the paper. Um, but at the same time, there's another issue that gets less attention right now in political circles, but I think it's no less important. There's a basic breakdown in the quality of the work of the civil service. You take away even the political debates and the political valence of these debates. You just look at the quality of work, and it seems to be that the civil service is really degrading in terms of the work it gets done just as a, a objective matter. And how do I know this or why am I thinking about this? Well, it's because the senior leaders themselves have brought this to my attention. You know, one of the joys of working here in Washington at the Hoover Institution is people in government come to me with interesting problems. Interesting to me, they, they're just problems for them. Um, but it was interesting in recent months to have members of the senior executive service approach me and say that they had a real problem with the bureaucracy, right? Even, these are leaders who are, not only are they nonpartisan in their roles, many of them um, are, as far as I can tell, demonstrably not conservative at all, or Republican, I, I assume they're, they're center-left Democrats. And they are, in their work as senior executives, really frustrated and disheartened by the quality of the work of the people they're supervising. And so they see a need for reform, too. Uh, which has created an opportunity for interesting conversations. And I don't just mean a, metaphorically, I mean literally. In the conference rooms here, we have meetings uh, where, where, where stakeholder groups are coming together and talking about the need for reform and opportunities for reform across ideological lines. So again, this paper was an effort to sort of think through the historical background of this uh, very briefly. 
um, but to help set the stage for my own thinking and, and eventually scholarship on this subject. So let's begin, well, I'm already five minutes in, with very recent history, right? This is the arrival of the Trump administration. I think the most interesting case study on this issue is President Trump's appointment of Scott Pruitt to run the EPA, right? And, and in recent months, there's been no shortage of uh, new stories about Administrator Pruitt. It's pretty clear he's made some very significant mistakes in the way that he's run his administration. Um, but even before you get to that point, it was interesting, the, the, the opposition that, that, that arose against him within the EPA before he took office. I mean, from the moment he was nominated, you had protests, I think even before he was, the protests might have even started before he was nominated, if I remember correctly, um, when news of his appointment or his nomination arose. People in the EPA joining protests, making statements. And in this paper, I just jot down a few uh, interesting quotes that were in the press from current um, people within the EPA or its recent leaders or other stakeholder groups. Here's just a few. Some of the quotes focus on, out, on opposition. Here you have the former communications director of the EPA saying, quote, the EPA career staff are committed to the mission. And we'll get back to that word mission in a little while. They won't stand for rollbacks of progress made reducing pollution. They'll fight dirty. Here's another one on leaks. The uh, president of the union that represents a lot of EPA uh, employees says, quote, I'm going to guess what was going on during the Reagan years. He's predicting leaks. I'm going to guess what was going on during the Reagan years when people started leaking to the press because they were worried about the agency being dismantled is what's going to happen today. He adds, today we have social media. We get it out there real quick. So there's the point about leaks, tactical leaks. And then back to that word mission. You have the former EPA administrator, Gina McCarthy, saying, quote, it's fine to have differing opinions on how to meet the mission of the agency. Many Republican administrators have had that. But here for the first time, I see someone, Pruitt, who has no commitment to the mission of the agency. Just a couple more. The Union of Concerned Scientists uh, president says, quote, EPA is composed of civil servants who have been there a long time and believe in the mission of the EPA and believe in the work they've done, I don't expect they'll go quietly into that good night. Other groups, the uh, Environmental Defense Fund published uh, a statement urging staff at the EPA not to quit, but rather to stay for a fight. Uh, former EPA staff published what they called a practical guide to resisting the Trump deregulatory agenda. They called it best practices for making agencies listen. Again, an interesting way that they phrase it, right? Making the agency leadership listen to them, right? Which, of course, is part of agencies work, but it, the, other, the other direction is important too, the, the bureaucracy listening to the leadership. But the best quote that I thought sums up all of this comes from a big article in the New Yorker. Somebody at the EPA anonymously said, quote, Pruitt is a temporary interloper. We are the real agency, and then the public is expecting us to protect the planet. Right? So many of these things come back to a basic question of mission. What or who defines the mission of an agency, and who is accountable to who? Is the bureaucracy accountable to the leadership, or is the leadership accountable to the bureaucracy? I think it's probably a mix of both in some ways. But in all of this, we see a very basic constitutional problem, right? I'm humble to say this in front of Professor McConnell. He could go on at length, uh, but I'll go very shortly. The Constitution vests the president alone, of course, with the executive power and with the obligation to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. And the framers didn't put those powers in a single official on accident. Right? They did it intentionally, right, because of the problems that arise when policy is made uh, by multi-member groups. Right? There's a place for multi-member decision-making. We call it Congress. We call it the Supreme Court. Right? But for the executive, the basic paradigm is one leader who's accountable and decisive. As Hamilton said famously in Federalist 70, uh, energy in the executive is a leading character of good government. Right? Not just in foreign affairs, but also in domestic government at home. We need energetic, decisive government. But of course, the president can't do it himself. The Constitution doesn't expect him to. So the Constitution sets forth at least some, some definition of the appointment of officials immediately under the president. And Taft here again in Humphrey's executor, he says the obvious. The president alone and unaided could not exec execute the laws. He must execute them by the assistance of subordinates. Um, uh, but of course, then th that's true in theory, but not necessarily 
the relationship doesn't work that well as a matter of historical fact. Clinton Rossiter in his book on the American presidency in the 1960s says, we've never had a time when the president was fully in control of the bureaucracy. He, he goes so far as to say that the president's power over administration is, in fact, the one major area of presidential activity in which his powers are simply not equal to his responsibilities. As Rossiter saw, the president never had real power sufficient to literally make good on his constitutional obligations, that so there's too much room for inertia or pushback in the bureaucracy. And if you look just a brief, you know, my paper does the briefest of skims of history, you see this from the very beginning, right, in the very first cabinet. There's now a Broadway musical about this, where you have the Secretary of State, you know, having his own sort of resistance movement in Washington's cabinet, right, in response to Washington's alignment with Hamilton. Um, and that's just one example, but the problem grows over time as the administration grows. And as you fast forward to the post-New Deal era, you see a common thread across basically all presidents, Democrat and, pres uh, Democrat and Republican alike. Basic frustration with the, with the bureaucracy, right? Truman says, I thought I was president, but when it comes to these bureaucrats, I can't do a damn thing. And then Truman starts joking about Eisenhower, what Eisenhower is going to get in the White House. He says, uh, Ike will sit here at this desk and he'll tap the desk and he'll say, do this, do that, and nothing will happen. Poor Ike, it won't be a bit like the Army, he'll be very frustrated. And it was very true, Ike was very frustrated. But my favorite example in all this historical record actually comes from JFK, and it's written up in a book by one of our colleagues, Neil Ferguson. Ferguson does this wonderful biography of Kissinger. There's this little anecdote in the middle. Um, of course, the anecdote that jumps out to a regulatory nerd like me. Uh, Arthur Schlesinger is in the JFK administration in the White House in the very first year, and he visits his friend Henry Kissinger. And Schlesinger is despondent. Here you have Schlesinger, the man who wrote the history of FDR and the celebration of the New Deal. And in the White House, he's despondent because the bureaucrats are stopping JFK from doing what he wants to do. Um, he says that, that, that so much for the new frontier, new frontiersmen are being picked off one by one, and the ice of bureaucracy is growing over the JFK administration. Right. That, more than anything, I think, tells the story of how this plagues Republicans and Democrats alike, and that's why the Hoover Commission focused on it so much in their famous Truman Era report. Um, but again, we must distinguish between two problems, right? Resistance and inertia, right? Inertia exists in any bureaucracy. Ask any corporate manager, right? We all know this. And, uh, with that in mind, James Q. Wilson, in his famous book on bureaucracy, says, what's surprising isn't that, bureau that bureaucrats sometimes defy the president, but rather the surprise is that they support the president's programs as much as they do. Right? There's something inherent in bureaucracy beyond government that finds people over and over again building empires in, within bureaucracy, right? resisting control from on top. That's just inherent in bureaucracy. And as a conservative like James Burnham once recognized in Congress in the American state, there is something to be said for a little bit of inertia and bureaucracy in government. In, his, in, in, in Burnham's diagnosis of the state of the constitutional government in 1960, he said it's not always a bad thing that you have continuity of policies from agency to agent, from, from administration to administration. That said, no matter how no matter what the small benefits might be, no matter how these problems might plague corporate government, it does remain a special, unique problem in our federal government because of that constitutional obligation upon the president to take care that the laws are faithfully executed and the vesting of the power in the president, uh, the executive power. Um, so part of my paper traces how we got here from there. It begins with Washington and his administration. Washington, the only president to have the advantage of starting the administration from the ground up. Right, you read this great book by Fergus Bordwich, The First Congress. It's all about nation building, right? It's about building the actual infrastructure of government in the form of the first laws and the first bureaucracies. Um, so Washington is able to bring together a government of gentlemen as he saw it, right? We focused on fitness of character. But Washington also wanted to make sure that the people in government actually supported the policies of the general government. Right? He, wouldn't, he at least said that the, the dissent against the federal laws, the federal policies, had no place in the bureaucracy. Jefferson really didn't disagree with that. He pushed for more diversity in the ranks. He wanted more Republicans in the government and some Federalists out. But he also claimed that he wanted strict neutrality in his bureaucracy. He wanted uh, uh, the bureaucracy to follow the politically appointed leadership. Jackson wanted that too, but in a different way. Right. With Jackson, we get a move away from this idea of, of government by gentlemen, and we 
start to move towards what would become the spoil system. A uh, system of administration in which the first priority was, an, was, was loyalty to the incumbent administration. Right? Solving a problem as Jackson saw it, of a lack of loyalty. Right? Jackson then moves the pendulum in a very far different direction. Right, where the, the, the true test of his government would be and his successors would be, what is the bureaucracy's loyalty to a given president? And the president could, could use that. Somebody's already planning their escape. Um, um, uh, using that loyalty, that system, as a political tool. And when that system breaks down, we're reminded of uh, Hamilton's point in the Federalist, an important, an, a point so important he makes it twice in 60, Federalist 68 and 76, right? That the true test uh, of good government is its aptitude and tendency to produce a good administration, right? And what the framer, what, what, what government saw in the breakdown of government sort of became unavoidable. As the spoil system broke down, we reached a moment where Charles Guiteau was assassinating a president in a dispute over civil service appointments. Um, uh, Congress enacts the Pendleton Act. Again, responding to the problem that precedes it and swing the pendulum in a very different direction. At first, in a very narrow way, only about 10% of federal jobs were subject to the Pendleton Act, but over time, a majority of federal jobs are now protected by the civil service reforms that are then boosted in 1978 with the Civil Service Reform Act, which creates things like the Office of Personnel Management, the Merit Systems Protection Board, Federal Labor Relations Authority, um, and at the same time, enforcement of political neutrality through laws in the earliest 20th century, like the, like the Hatch Act. So we've reached a point today where we have a system that's nominally dedicated to neutral competence. But I think, once again, as history's unfolded, we will actually see as a bureaucracy um, that is ideologically aligned much more with one political party than another. And that problem seems to be unsustainable. And it's not just a matter of the Trump administration and those sorts of things. We've seen this before in the Bush administration, same agency, probably not a coincidence, the EPA. From 2001 onward, we saw a pattern of leaking and obstruction. There's a really interesting book by a woman named Margot Oge. She was in charge of the Clean Air Office in the EPA. She wrote a memoir called Driving the Future, I think an un unintentionally telling title for her book, where she talks about how the bureaucrats of the EPA celebrated. They had, had a party inside the EPA the day they lost Massachusetts versus EPA <laughs> with champagne and everything. Um, and they said, we won, we won. And what they meant was we, the bureaucracy, won over the appointed leadership in the Bush administration. Now, the thing is, I think that bureaucratic resistance, the lesson to take away from, from Massachusetts versus EPA is that the bureaucratic resistance actually plays to some of the conceits of modern administrative law. This idea of a sharp division between, between politics and expertise and that what agencies do is primarily politics. Well, even in, especially in rulemaking, what it really is is, is value judgments, as much, the trading off of values as much as it is just neutral competence. And I think the experience of the last several years and, 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 and most recent years suggests that maybe the pendulum has swung too far the other way. If the resistance movement had continued as loudly as it had begun, you know, longer, maybe there would have been political capital or political energy to legislate reforms. The resistance movement, I think, wisely quieted down. Um, but we'll see how it plays out with the rest of, the, of this administration. Like I said, this paper, it's very brief, and it's just me sort of thinking these initial things through. I don't have any solutions yet. I do have just a few concluding thoughts. First is that point about mission. Bureau the bureaucracy has a concept of mission that it thinks stands above everything else. Now, it wouldn't say we're making this up, right? They'd say this comes from the statutes, right? And so I think the, 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 the problem of disputes over mission is ultimately a problem of delegation, right? This is Congress defining statutes far too broadly um, and giving the bureaucracy basically room to define its mission for itself from agency to agency. Um, two minutes. Um, so I'll, I'll just make that point and leave it at that. The, 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 the debate over mission is central to all of this, but it's really a, a debate over delegation. Second. I think progressive administrations have a first mover advantage, right? We saw this in the last administration with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, or now as it's called by its legal name, the Bureau of Consumer Financial Protection. Um, um, there's a first mover advantage in creating an agency and staffing it up for the first time, right? Because what you attract are 
government employees who are dedicated to the initial administration's definition of the mission. There was great reporting in the Washington Post at the time about how energized the CFPB was by the, by the, the officials and employees that it drew in. There was even a bit of a culture clash within the agency because part of the agency was taken from the old Office of Thrift, Thrift Supervision, which is an old sleepy agency, and it really couldn't keep up with the energized first generation of CFPB employees who are still there. Right, and we're about to hear a lot more about this now that a new CFPB director has been has been nominated. Right, this clash between the incumbent bureaucracy and the leadership. The the president who creates an agency defines that agency for generations to come. Um, the public, I, I won't dwell on the issue of public sector unions. Obviously, they complicate um, these these issues. Um, they really haven't been interested in the sort of uh, cross uh, ideological dialogues that I've been engaged in, um, and then. There is the constitutional problem. The Constitution doesn't really de define what an officer is. Right? We saw this a bit yesterday in the Supreme Court with the Lucia versus SEC case, where Justice Kagan you know, wrote for the majority, um, striking down the process for appointing um, uh, administrative law judges at the SEC. Anybody who teaches administrative law knows these categories are practically indeterminate, principal officer, inferior officer, employee. Um, and so that, I think, is going to require attention from the courts. Um, and then just the last point is, S much of this discussion is going to be defined in coming years by changes in the economy and generational changes. The modern economy is much different than the economy that justified and produced old expectations about government employment and, and management metrics. Um, today's managers expect more because they're drawing from um, uh, advances in management in the private economy. And so I think developments in the private economy will actually help drive, to some extent, reform in the public sector. I think it's inevitable. Um, and I'll just leave it at that, actually. Okay. Thank you very much. And thanks, Adam, for leaving time for a few questions. So I noticed that Jennifer had a question. Oh, we've got lots of hands up, so I'll, I'll take those down. Um, why don't you, since we have so many hands up, I'm going to collect some. Do you mind? No, no, no. So I'll collect four. One, two, three, four. So go Jennifer first. So this is a very interesting project. I found it particularly fascinating because I participated in what I think was the first rule of law conference. Was that right? Yes. And it was focused um, on executive power, of course, under the old administration. So what it was focused on was abuses of executive power. And I encourage you to take a look at the symposium issue in the Journal of Legal Analysis mm -hmm. because the, the first article there, who was really a originally a discussant, sort of puts a context for it, which is it's the use of informal adjudication mm -hmm. for the executive to go places beyond where Congress might have and the courts can constrain. And um, at that time, I think many of us thought that limiting executive power, even though obviously the president has been empowered to execute the laws, but that doesn't mean he gets to do whatever he wants. Well. I think it's useful to sort of take that framework and say, well, how would someone look at the Trump administration who wasn't a true believer? And they might think that there is an issue not of Obama's use of, well, I won't enforce if you agree to these conditions, but statutes that say this is the law, this is supposed to be enforced, mm -hmm. and a strategic use of non-enforcement of environmental laws. There's absolutely strategic non-enforcement of the securities laws against publicly held firms. There's a dramatic shift in enforcement. There's a switch in resources to violent crimes away from white collar crimes. So there's a lot of strategic non-enforcement. Some of that could be legitimate. Some of that could be not enforcing laws Congress put in place. And we didn't like it in the original one when Obama was not enforcing immigration laws that Congress had put in place, right? That was considered an abuse. So when you think about this, I think it's very useful to say, well, how would you feel about it if you switch the name of the president to Obama and switch the name of the laws to immigration? And do you, what solution would you want vis-a-vis -vis the civil service who might think they're actually upholding the laws that Congress adopted yeah. when they're resisting. 
Can I, can I answer to that first? Because I think that's a very important, and I, I think it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a well taken as the first question. It's funny, a couple of weeks ago, um, I was at the, uh, the American Constitutional Society has their annual conference, and um, I was frankly the token conservative on the panel. Um, and one of my points throughout this, it was about regulatory reform, and one of the points I made over and over again, because I think it's true and I think it's important, is that there's real continuity between this administration and the previous administration in the way it goes about making and enforcing policy. Um, and I used a lot of examples. One is strategic non-enforcement. One is wielding the power of the purse in certain ways. I think that there's real connection between these, and we see it popping up in the exact same policy issues, right? Immigration, uh, Affordable Care Act implementation, and so on. We see a lot of continuity between both administrations, and I think our, our, our analysis and our criticism of process should be even-handed and should focus on both of these. And so believe me, I spent as much time complaining about these things as I did during the last administration. Here, here. Uh, in the back, please identify yourself. Uh, <clears throat> my name's Charles Schott. I'm with the Center for Financial Stability uh, up in New York uh, City. Um, and. Um, I, I wanted to express, I guess, gentle disagreement with your premise mm -hmm. and on the theory that what I, by disagreeing, I'm offering you hope. Um, the, the, the idea that the federal bureaucracy is inherently in opposition to any administration is, I think, not correct. Um, I think part of the challenge is you've chosen an agency of EPA where 90% of their agenda is subject to intense partisan conflict. I would refer you as probably the best example that I've ever come across to the Reagan era Federal Communications Commission and how the FCC has evolved uh, ever since. The chairman of the FCC in those days was a fellow named Mark Fowler, who I think is uh, not uh, given the, the credit uh, he deserves, but he cared intensely about management. And what you're talking about, really, is the area where management meets policy and how you implement policy or create policy using management tools and administrative tools to help uh, uh, bring that along. His premise was that 20 percent of the bureaucracy is in opposition to you, 10 percent is supportive, and 70 percent just want to do their job and get ahead. And if you find a way, um, for example, using your example, of actively defining your objectives and policy overview, uh, creating a management by objective system so that actions of the bureaucracy are referenced to those objectives as you manage through. Um, when people resist, you just offer a way to people behind them who just want to get ahead to, to, to do that and, and grade them appropriately, positively for doing what they've been uh, requested to do. Um, it does involve a lot of paperwork, but uh, it's, uh, it, it really changed the nature of the agency from one, if you read a book called The Reluctant Regulators about the Gerald Ford FCC, mm -hmm. it, 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 it comes across as being a zoo, a madhouse. Nicholas Johnson doing chanting in, in his office uh, and, and resisting on, uh, on every uh, front to one where the chairman of the FCC is now the, the manager of the FCC and the others, um, uh, to a larger or lesser extent, um, are, are often in support. And um, um, compare that to the, the Reagan era FTC, which I had a personal experience going and, and dealing with uh, Janet Steiger as chairman of that. The entire impression was I was back in, in the uh, Ford administration where it was very clear the bureaucrats were not only, they weren't resisting, they ran the agency. They were presenting all of the options to the managers, and they weren't shy about it. So I think this is a management issue, and I think if you accept the premise that 70 percent of the people just want to get ahead, there is a tremendous opportunity for undertaking the study of management in the federal context at a place like Heritage or, or you know, the Hoover is right across the street from the Stanford Business School. Mm -hmm. um, I would just uh, suggest that uh, there is hope. Yeah, there you go. Hi, Nicole Garnett. Um, I actually, just when you were talking, this is a fascinating project to me. I wonder if you want to think about the connection between this sort of one-way ratchet problem you describe and the, the first mover advantage and a different kind of bureaucratic 
growth, which is the growth of political appointees that don't have to go through confirmation, um, because it's just a way the administrations come can check. You know, my recent law grads to check the bureaucracy, and um, it seems to me that that model is just, it creates a different kind of bloat. They they do come and go with administrations. Just one small anecdote. I had to come to me. And he said he wanted to work in the Justice Department Honors Program, but he was a little worried. I said, "Why?" I thought he wasn't a very good student, but um, <laughs> he said, uh, "Well, let me show you who they're hiring." And he, there's a list of the areas: so civil rights, two. Education, one, I don't know, antitrust, two, immigration, 150. Yeah. So it was obvious what was happening was they're trying to, you know, staff up the immigration enforcement with a bunch of Trump friendly lawyers who would check the, the bureaucrats, the civil service bureaucrats who were typically going to be resistant to the immigration policies that Trump wanted to, to administer. Yeah. Uh yeah, I, I agree. This is a really interesting project. Um, I guess what I have an intuition that the bureaucracy is more nefarious in some agencies and, than others. Sure. Uh, like the closer an agency is to some sort of like executive function, or maybe like the Department of Justice, maybe maybe it's sort of especially nefarious because it can cut across all sorts of different things the administration wants to do. Whereas in the post office, it seems kind of innocuous. Um, so they uh, want you to think. Well, uh, yeah. So, uh, but but you know, no. I, I teach the post office multiple days in constitutional law, and people ignore it at their peril. So I'm wondering, uh, am I am I wrong about that intuition? Am I right? Where where do you think it's the most nefarious? I mean, I. I Why don't you take all the questions? Yeah, well, and I'll start with Will's since it's fresh on my mind. Um, yeah, I think you're right. I, and this point was raised earlier by, by Charles, right? That not all bureaucracies are the same. They have different mission, so to speak. Um, some are more technocratic than others. Some have just different tools or prox proximity to the president or lack of proximity to the president. And so I don't mean to paint everything with a broad brush, right? That was one of the things that I admire so much about the mid early to mid 20th century administrative law work, right? The stuff that preceded the APA and then the Hoover Commission afterwards is that you had government working in conjunction with scholars and others really looking seriously at the administrative agencies as they existed and operated at the time, right? These voluminous reports, the Brownlow Commission, and the things that gave rise to the APA and Hoover and everything else, where they looked at the agencies as they actually existed and tried to map laws onto them in a way that actually reflected and affected reality. Um, and I don't think we have enough of that. Um, I think one of the problems about the current debate is, is it gets a little bit superficial. And having being the author of a superficial report, I plead guilty too. But my goal is to focus more on specificity. You know, this is Will's point, but also Charles's. Um, you know, there are some conservative bureaucracies, right? The Pentagon. I think about how suspicious Democratic presidents are of the Pentagon and and its bureaucracy and that relationship. I mean, this does cut both ways. I think on you know, and while I said that all administrations are plagued by bureaucracy, I think Republican presidents have in the modern era felt it much more acutely. Um, in general, but not in every specific case. Um, and again, sometimes it's just a problem of bureaucratic inertia, not resistance. So I'm trying to think clearly about these categories um, and, and s make sure that I'm not being too superficial across the board. Um, as Charles, you said, the issue is often one of management, right? And something I've tried to think about just in the last couple of years of, of the Trump administration, um, when Trump began by issuing all these executive orders, which I think for a variety of reasons was a good thing, and I wrote a short piece for the Notre Dame Law Review sketching out why I think it's good that presidents lead with these regulatory executive orders. The downside to it is that it's adversarial, right? You order people to do something. It doesn't mean, you know, an order is almost inherently adversarial in a way. You're directing somebody to do something they wouldn't necessarily do on their own. Um, and so the downside of reliance on executive orders is it does sort of tee up the issue as the president versus a, bu a bureaucracy in a way. And just one, one other thing, um, a related problem is the problem of, of presidents, largely Republican presidents, avoiding the bureaucracy. Some of this happened during the Reagan years where you had the political leaders not really engaging the agencies or engaging the bureaucracy. Ultimately, leadership is, is, involves management, and management involves a dialogue between the employer and the employee. Um, and so you get this problem, and this gets back to Will, with um, 
um, or sorry, Nicole's point about about the relationship between the political appointees and the bureaucracy, you get these problems of super bureaucracies, right, of a layering of bureaucracy of the president's team versus the agency, famously the State Department, right, where there's now this sort of quasi-State Department in the White House, right, through the, the National Security Council and, and so on. Um, and there's some benefit to that. Those folks are much more responsive to the president. The downside is there's now an even broader gulf between the president and the actual State Department. Um, and so it might serve a good short-term purpose, but with real problematic structural long-term effects. Um, and then, Nicole, I think the thing you're talking about with the hiring of all these political bureaucrats is, becomes the issue of burrowing, right, where you hire an, an administration hires people for political reasons in, in or around the civil service and then tries to bur burrow them in to change the civil service. On the one hand, it could be a useful corrective. On the other hand, it's no way to run a country, right, where it's this basic suspicion of who's working in the bureaucracy and whose political ends they're really pursuing, the current president or the one before. Um, just one last point, and this gets back to Charles. Um, I think key in all, and I'm, I'm sorry, we're up against time, so this will be the last thing I say. Um, um, the key really is metrics. I think right now the, the most important short-term step that regulatory reformers could make in this area is just um, fighting for the legitimacy of metrics in management. Right? Usually you try to decide what the good metrics are and then implement them. This is one of those occasions where I actually think you have to go in reverse order. I think just the fight to impose metrics-based management, real objective standards of management on the modern federal bureaucracy is an important fight and it's the fight you have to have first. After that, we can debate what's a good metric, what's a bad metric. But right now, I think the fight is just over whether you have real metrics at all. And I know the Civil Service and the Merit System Protection Board were intended to have that effect. But as the folks from the Senior Executive Service make clear to me, it's not working. And so that's why I'm so optimistic about the sort of cross-ideological dialogues we've been, ha been able to have here. We had one last month, another one next month, another one in September, and hopefully after that, some sort of joint statement of bipartisan principles upon which reform could actually be pursued. Charles, I'll talk with you afterwards, but I think I'm already over my time. Well, you are over your time, but I want to also mention one of the – we don't have time for another question right now, Diana. Sorry. One quick Sorry. One. Well, we're way over. Go ahead. One sentence. I think that we just need to acknowledge that in these the time when you say that the bureaucrats uh, are resisting President Trump, that a lot of the appointees who are supposed to be managing the, these bureaucrats are not confirmed. There's 200 people waiting to be confirmed. Undersecretary for Management at State isn't there. You know, three Deputy Assistant, uh, Assistant Attorney Generals aren't there. So that's one also problem. There just isn't anyone to manage. That's, I think, a, a crucial point. That top layer of political appointee right. is the transmission belt by which the energy in the executive gets transmitted to the bureaucracy, and that's, that's crucial. I, I resist uh, pointing out that there's been a wonderful coincidence here today, which is if you look at uh, this topic that you've been talking about, it was also central to the discussion in the first session. Bob Topel brought it out in the discussion of how we w think we should be modeling the problems that Diana was documenting. And we're going to come back to it again uh, multiple times today, but especially in the last session, which I'm going to be giving Gary Leibkamp's paper, where it's the same issue. And it, it seems like a major issue for us, and I want all of you to be thinking about it, because I think it's a topic we should take on directly in this group, which is the agency problem modeled structurally, thinking about those three dimensions you outlined, Bob, but also thinking about how agencies may be cross-sectional, there may be cross-sectional variation that we can exploit coming from different kinds of agencies. And uh, I also like this idea of the top layer being different from the rest. Uh, and, and of course, it's all very different. You know, the, in the finance area, the SEC and the Fed are completely different. The FDIC is completely different from the Fed. So I think it's interesting here to think about this topic of the incentives and the management uh, and possible things that you can do either in the governance of the agencies or in the way statutes are constructed that are going to minimize these problems. So I, I think we've stumbled onto something as a group that is a great topic for us going forward, Michael. So I, I just wanted to get all of you to think more about that. Thank you very much.